So now that we spent a little bit of time on the history of the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, or the Edgeworth product moment correlation coefficient, the PPMCC, let's get to everyone's next favorite subject outside of history, and that is math. So conceptually, what a correlation is, is the degree to which X and Y vary together divided by the degree to which X and Y vary separately. In other words, the top of the equation is the effect, it's the relationship, it's the strength of how well these two variables predict each other. And that's going to be the same in almost any of our parametric statistics. The top of the equation is always going to be the actual relationship, the varying, the actual varying together, the actual difference between the two groups, whatever it is we're looking at, the effect size is usually what we're isolating on the top of the equation. The bottom of the equation is going to be almost always some form of the total variance that's involved. In other words, how much variance is there and how much of that variance is actually due to a relationship. So mathematically, the Pearson product moment correlation, correlation coefficient is the sum of products divided by the sums of squares. So we're going to take a look individually at how we actually create this equation. And again, like all of the math that we're going to be doing in this class, all we're doing is addition, subtraction, multiplication, and sometimes taking something to the power or taking the square root of it. So in this equation, we're going to create, we're going to basically create the top of the equation, which is the sum of the sum of products. And a product is basically how each person's score, as it varies from the mean of that score, multiplies by their other score minus the mean of that score. So if we look at the sum of products, we have their individual score on the first predictor minus the mean of that predictor, multiplied by their individual score on the second variable, minus the mean of that variable. So for each person, we're going to take their score on the first variable minus the mean and multiply it by their score on the second variable minus the mean. We're going to then, once we've taken that, we're going to do it for each individual person. So if we had 10 people, our sample of 10, we do this 10 times and we need to add up all those products. So we're creating products, their individual score minus the mean times their individual score minus the mean. And then we're summing those together. We're adding them together. And that is the sum of products. The sum of squares is simply their individual score minus the mean squared and added together. And again, once we have these two, we're going to plug it into that top equation. The sum of products just goes in the top, but the sums of square for x is multiplied by the sums of square for y, and then we take the square root. So let's talk briefly about what this is doing. If you notice that the sum of products is allowed to hold on to the positives and negatives. So if I've got a mean of five on my first score, my X variable, the X variable is a one to 10 scale. I had a score, a mean of five on that across all 10 participants. And my individual score, the individual person I'm looking at actually had the top score, a 10. So 10 minus five is a positive five. Now, if they also scored very high on Y, so let's say Y's mean is three, but this person scored a six, six minus three would be a three. So now I have five times three, 15. It's a pretty big number. So I'm putting a large number on the top of that equation. But if someone really didn't have much of a relationship or it really just didn't matter, the individual score, for example, the mean was five, the, um, uh, uh, the mean was five on X, three on Y, and their score was a four and a two. So then it'd be one and one, we'd multiply it, we might get a negative number, we might get a positive number, and that also then would be added to the sum of products. So you can kind of see if everyone has a very strong positive relationship, as we add all those numbers together, we're gonna to get a very large number on the top of the equation, the effect. If they're kind of, some people were high on one variable and low on another, some people had no relationship, some people had a positive relationship, some had a negative relationship, those products, some are gonna be positive, some are gonna be negative, when we add them together, it might end up being a very small number. And again, the bottom of the equation is always squared and then taken the square root, which means we're removing the sign negative and positive. So no matter what the variance is there, whether it was a positive relationship, negative relationship, or no relationship, it still adds to the variance on the bottom. 
So we're getting all variance on the bottom, regardless of whether it's a positive or negative or no relationship. And we're only getting a high number on the top of the equation if there was some form of consistent relationship. All positive, all negative. So again, breaking the equation apart, the sum of products we already talked about, that's each person's individual score on the first predictor, X, minus the mean of that predictor, multiplied by their individual score on Y, minus the mean of Y. The sums of squares of X is simply everyone's individual score about on X, minus the mean squared, and that gets rid of that positive or negative sign to where it's just whatever that variance is, we're keeping it. And similarly, the sum of squares for y is each person's individual score on y minus the mean of y, and again, squared. So we're going to kind of go through a way to kind of conceptualize this mathematically and not get lost in all the numbers. And that usually is to put it all into a fairly easy to understand table, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So again, we've got our scores. So in this case, I have five participants, and I want to look at the correlation between study time and test score. So for each line, that represents one person. So the first person studied zero hours and got a 30. The second person studied 10 hours and got a 90. The next person studied four hours and got a 30. The next person studied eight hours and got a 60. And again, the next person studied eight hours and got a 90. Now we can see a bit of a pattern here. The highest score, 90s, are with eight and 10 study hours. And the two lowest scores, a 30, were with zero and four study hours. So there looks to be a pattern, but our question is, is, is that pattern solid enough, strong enough, that we are sure it happened due to study being related to test score and not just some random fluctuation in the fact we only had five participants? But again, for this example, we're going to use these five participants and we're going to use these scores. So the first thing we're going to, of course, need to do is make our hypotheses. So our null hypothesis, of course, is there's no relationship. Our alternative hypothesis in this case is there is some form of relationship. And by the way, correlations tend to be non-directional hypotheses. Most of the tables are set up on a two-tailed test. Now, again, if you actually have a directional correlational hypothesis, you may need to check that and change the actual um, value that you're accepting for alpha of 0.05. Once again, our degrees of freedom are n minus two. So in this case, we have five participants, five minus two is three. And if we look at the table, if we look at the degrees of freedom for three, we're gonna see that for an alpha of 0 0.05, we need to find a correlation of 0.878. That's fairly close to 1.0. That's a very strong correlation for us to be 100% sure with this small of a sample that it was due to chance. Now notice how that number goes down fairly significantly as we add participants. So if I had 15 people in this study, I would only need to find almost well, less than half, 0.48 almost, or let, no, near half of the correlation strength for me to claim that it was significant at 0.05. So I have my alpha 0.05, I have my degrees of freedom, I have the critical value that I need to find for me to be able to claim significance at 0.05. So now all that's left is to actually run the statistic to hand compute as the sum of products, the sums of squares for X, and the sums of square for Y. And that brings us to this table. So first, I, the first column, represents participant number. So one, two, three, four, five. The next column is X, their individual score on the first predictor, 0, 10, 4, 8, and 8. And then Y, their score on Y. Now, the first thing we need to do is actually calculate the means for X and Y. So we're going to add up sum the scores on X. So 0 plus 10 plus 4 plus 8 plus 8 equals 30. And likewise, sum the scores on Y, the test scores, 30 plus 90 plus 30 plus 60 plus 90 is 300. We're then going to divide those by the number of participants, so sum divided by N, and we're going to get a mean of X for 6 and a mean of Y of 60. So the mean, mathematical mean, of study hours was 6. The mathematical mean of test score was a 60. Now we just need to do some calculations. So our next column is X minus mean. The mean again is 6. So x minus 6, if x is 0, first column, is negative 6. The next column, 10 minus 6, is a 4. So again, we're simply calculating that down, and you can just walk down the table to see how that's done. Their next score, participant 3 had a 4, 4 minus 6 is 2. Participant 4 had an 8, 8 minus 6 is 2. 
but positive 2. And then the last participant had 8. Again, 8 minus 6 is 2. We're now going to do the same for y. So in this case, the first person's score on y was 30. 30 minus 60 is negative 30. The next person's score was 60. 60 minus, I'm sorry, it was 90. 90 minus 60 is 30. Next score again is 30. 30 minus 60 is negative 30. Then 60, 60 minus 60 is 0. And again, another 90. 90 minus 60 is 30. Now we need to create the sum of products. So we've got each person's individual score minus the mean on x, each person's individual score of y minus the mean. We now simply multiply them together for the next column, the sum of products. So for example, participant 2, 4 times 30 is 120. So if we look at that column of x minus the mean of x multiplied by y minus the mean of y, the sum of products, you'll notice that the top person had a 180, the next person had a 120, then a 60, then a 0, then a 60. And again, what we're wanting is the sum of products. We're going to add those together. Now, the next thing we need to do is the sum of squares. So sum of squares, we're simply going to take, again, their score minus the mean and multiply it by itself. We're going to square it. So in this case, x minus the mean of x squared, if we look down the column, so for the column 3, or row 3, participant 3, had a negative 2, x minus mean. We multiply that. Negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. And again, we're going to do that and then sum it up at the bottom, and we're going to do it for y as well. So doing this process, we now have the sum of products, 420. We have the sum of squares for x, 64. And we have the sums of square for y, 3,600. Those are the three numbers we now need to plug into that initial equation to actually get our Pearson's R. So we're going to take these three numbers and move them on to the next slide. So again, we're simply going to plug them in. So that 420 goes on the top of the equation. The 64 and the 3,600 go on the bottom of the equation. We multiply 64 by 3,600, but then that value we take the square root of. That becomes the bottom of the equation, and that's what we divide 420 by, and we actually get a fairly strong Pearson's correlation, 0.875. That's a strong relationship. However, remember our degrees of freedom was only 3, and the critical R we needed was 0.878. We just missed. In this particular case, the conclusion is there was not a significantly significant value because P was larger than 0.05. There was not a relationship between study and exam score. Now, if we go back to that original table, we'll see that if we had just had a couple more participants, as long as we got this strong of a correlation, it would have been significant. And that's also a quick lesson on the importance of sample size when you're running statistical tests. And again, if we just had one extra participant, it would have gone from 0.878